Based on the fossil record, we know that there have been five mass extinction events in the last 540 million years. These are events in which more than 50% of all living species die. Prior to this time, uh, animals with hard body parts and hence significant fossilisation had not yet evolved. These have sometimes been caused by atmospheric changes, such as by outbreaks of massive volcanic activity, or in the case of the asteroid that hit the Earth some 65 million years ago, wiping out the dinosaurs uh, because of the throwing up of an enormous dust cloud that affected the atmosphere. These atmospheric changes have sometimes resulted in massive glaciation with falling of sea levels, or the reverse, the melting of glaciers with consequent rising of the oceans, which devastate shallow marine ecosystems and coastal areas. By examining the fossil record, we've been able to establish that nine vertebrate species would normally have become extinct since 1900. Unfortunately, however, since 1900, there have actually been 468 extinctions of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. And so the researchers conducting this study have concluded that a sixth mass extinction event is therefore beginning. This study simply considered the kill mechanisms of habitat loss, pollution, and predation. It didn't try to factor in the effects of climate change. A key cause is habitat destruction and deforestation. Livestock production now occupies some 30% of the Earth's land surface. In his recent book, Dead Zone, Professor Philip Limbury describes flying over vast areas of previously forested Amazon jungle in South America. And he describes flying for hundreds of kilometers over pasture and feed crops that were previously occupied by virgin rainforest. Some 70% of previously forested Amazonian land is now occupied by pasture, with feed crops to feed livestock animals occupying a large part of the remainder. Urban areas and cities are increasingly encroaching upon wilderness areas, and pollution, whether organic pollutants, pesticides, heavy metals, and so on, all sorts of industrial chemicals getting into the environment are increasingly causing uh, species loss. The current geological era is the first in which human beings are having the dominant impact upon our planetary climate and the environment. Accordingly, it's been termed the Anthropocene. We're now starting to live through one of those rare periods in history when our planetary life support systems are being dismantled. These are the ecosystem support services on which we all depend. These include things like the forests that supply the oxygen we need to breathe, the rains and the snows that supply the glaciers, that supply the river systems on which we depend, and animals like bees that pollinate our flowering plants. And all of this is before we even begin to consider the effects of climate change. Since 1970, the average surface temperature of the Earth has increased by 0.6 degrees Celsius. And the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts temperature rises globally of between 2 and 6 degrees Celsius this coming century. We used to think that 2 degrees above 1970 temperature levels would be a global tipping point at which positive feedback mechanisms would cause runaway climate change to occur. And these are things like the melting of the polar ice caps and the thawing of the Arctic tundra, releasing millions of tonnes of methane gas, which had been locked up in frozen bogs in the frozen landscape. And methane is a powerful greenhouse gas helping to warm the atmosphere. These changes are changing the geographic range and migratory habitats of animals all around the planet. Species on average are starting to move some 17 kilometres towards the poles and climb 11 metres higher in the mountains every decade as they seek an ecological niche similar to that in which they evolved. These changes are benefiting some species of course. Species like bark beetles are doing very well and are spreading across the uh, northwest forests of America, devastating the forests as they go. On the other hand, Australia's koala bears eat only certain species of eucalyptus leaves and as these absorb more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, unfortunately they're starting to become toxic to koalas. The Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change has estimated that one third of all species are set to become extinct due to climate change, and that climate change poses the greatest threat to life on Earth since the last mass extinction event some 65 million years ago that wiped out the dinosaurs. As an Australian, I love the sea. I spent countless hours happily snorkeling when I should have been studying for my high school exams. 
Snorkeling and scuba diving became my gateway to miraculous underwater worlds. I remember exploring ancient shipwrecks, encountering inquisitive sharks, majestic stingrays, and swimming over pieces of coral the size of small cars on the Great Barrier Reef. It was clear to me that coral reefs are one of the wonders of our world. They're home to an estimated 1 to 3 million species, including more than a quarter of all marine fish. They are the most biodiverse of all marine ecosystems, and literally the rainforests of the oceans. Accordingly, I find it particularly tragic that the world's coral reefs are now dying en masse. Around 30% of all of the world's coral reefs have now been seriously damaged from pollution, invasive alien species such as the coral-eating crown of thorns starfish, and from overfishing. Around 93% of global temperature increases go into our oceans. These temperature rises kill the fragile unicellular algae that reside within coral polyps, giving them their colours. The result is so-called bleaching when the coral turn white. Unfortunately, increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide dissolves into the oceans, acidifying them and hindering regeneration of the coral. Scientific consensus is that stabilising global carbon dioxide levels above 350 parts per million will not be sufficient to prevent the catastrophic loss of coral reefs worldwide. By early 2019, global carbon dioxide levels were well above 400 parts per million and rising, and it's estimated that some 60% of the world's coral reefs will be lost by 2030. I've also been very privileged to have twice descended the Valley Blanche, which is one of the world's longest and highest off-piste ski runs. Descending from some 3,800 metres up in the French Alps, 2,000 metres down a series of glaciers to emerge into the Chamonix Valley. The final glacier that you ski along if you ski the Valley Blanche is called the Mer de Glace, the Sea of Ice. This is the largest glacier in all of the French Alps. And this glacier, along with all of the others, is rapidly melting. And it's thought that all of the glaciers in the Alps might be gone within a generation. The melting of glaciers, and in particular the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets, combined with thermal expansion of the oceans, is expected to raise global sea levels by up to six feet. Rises of just half this level would devastate the rice-growing deltas and floodplains of southern Asia on which hundreds of millions of people depend for food. Similarly, the Himalayan and Tibetan glaciers that sustain the major rivers of India and China that supply the grain irrigation systems on which hundreds of millions of people depend are also rapidly melting. And this has been described as the greatest threat to food security ever faced by humanity. Unfortunately, there are other problems too. For every one degree global temperature rise, crop yields decline by about 10%. Additionally, the world population is rapidly growing and we're adopting increasingly consumptive lifestyles. By early 2019, there were some 7.7 .7 billion people, with the world population expected to rise to some 9 billion by 2040. Around 3 billion of these people are consumers in developing nations who are rapidly seeking to emulate the more consumptive lifestyles of those of us who are lucky enough to live in developed nations. At the top of this food chain are consumers in the United States and Canada, who each consume around about 800 kilograms of grain per year, most of it indirectly in the form of cows, sheep, uh, pigs, eggs and milk. And at the bottom of the food chain are consumers in developing nations such as India who consume only around about 200 kilograms of grain per person per year. Because when we convert grain into animals and then consume the animal products, most of the energy is lost during the conversion process. Additionally, extreme weather events such as droughts and floods are occurring ever more frequently and with greater severity, also destroying crops. Fueled by increasing demand, the prices of staples such as wheat, rice, corn and soya tripled from mid-2006 to mid-2008 and are increasing as global demand continues to rise. And unfortunately, it's people in the developing world who are least able to pay for increasing prices. In the mid-1990s, some 825 million people suffered from hunger and malnutrition. The total now exceeds more than 1 billion people and is still rising. When considering the causes of climate change, a lot of attention has been given to the burning of fossil fuels and to transportation. And yet all of the cars, trucks, buses and planes worldwide 
contribute only some 13.5% of global greenhouse gases. One of the first major evidence-based estimations of the contributions of the livestock sector came out in 2006 and was produced by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. The latest estimations are that the livestock sector produces some 16% of all human-generated greenhouse gases. This comes from clearing forests to graze livestock and to grow feed crops to feed to livestock. It comes from the livestock directly and it comes from the transport and processing of livestock products. The livestock sector produces some 9% of all human generated carbon dioxide, mostly released from uh, chopping down of forests. It produces some 37% of all human generated methane gases, which mostly come from the fermentation of grasses in the stomachs of ruminant animals such as cows and sheep. And it produces around about 65% of all nitrous oxide, which comes from the gases released by manure slurry produced by livestock farmed on industrial scales and around about 64% of all ammonia which contributes to acid rain and ecosystem acidification. Unfortunately methane is 72 times more damaging than carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide is a spectacular 296 times more damaging than carbon dioxide is. Mitigation strategies have been suggested to try to decrease the impacts of the livestock sector on climate change, such as feeding cows more concentrated diets, which decrease the production of methane from their stomachs. Unfortunately, however, these diets are more expensive and not available to many farmers around the world. There are also technologies being developed for management of the manure these animals produce to try to decrease the amount of nitrogenous gases that they release into the atmosphere Again, these technologies are often expensive and unavailable to many farmers around the world. A major problem is that we expect global meat and dairy consumption to approximately double by the year 2050. Accordingly, the amount of environmental impact must be cut by a massive 50% just to keep the environmental impacts at the present level. And we know that the present level is leading to global catastrophe. When receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, for the work of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change in 2007, the head of the panel, Dr. Rajinder Pachauri, called upon the world to please eat less meat. And he's since repeated and strengthened that call. To that call, we also need to encourage people to please eat less dairy and also less eggs, given the dramatic impact of dairy cows on the environment and the severe animal welfare impacts of industrial scale egg production. Changing our consumption patterns is the only way to address climate change that doesn't require the development of speculative new technologies or the large-scale alteration of our transport patterns, most of which occur for work purposes rather than for leisure. Transitioning to a plant-based diet is the only thing we can all do immediately that will have a major impact on climate change, as well as major positive benefits for public health and for animal welfare.